Welcome everybody to lesson five of a friendly introduction to abstract algebra part one groups. In today's video you are going to learn about the concept of a subgroup. This is a common theme in algebra whenever I have some algebraic structure. One studies the substructures. For example, if you know about vector spaces, you study subspaces. If you have an algebra, you study subalgebras. If you have a ring, there's the concept of a subring. Before we go into the details, as always, a quick overview of this video. First of all, of course, we are going to define what we mean by a subgroup. Then there will be some easy examples for subgroups including a graphic depiction of the subgroups of the dihedral group of the um, equilateral triangle. And then we are going to prove a subgroup criterion, how one can check that one actually has a subgroup. And in the end, we are looking at the so-called torsion subgroup of an abelian group, and we are actually going to show that this is indeed a subgroup. All right, so the definition is pretty obvious. We take a subset of a group G with operation dot. And this here means subset. And this means it is allowed that the subset is the whole group. So the whole group is also a subset of itself. If I write it like that, this means it is a real subset. So it is not equal to the whole set. So and if this subset is itself a group, of course, with this group operation dot, then it is called a subgroup of G and we denote it like that. This is not read as less than or equal to, but this is our symbol for a subgroup. So to be more clear, I should include here is a group with respect, of course, to the operation in the larger group. All right, simple example would be the integers. The integers are a subgroup of the rational numbers. If my operation here is simply addition of numbers, because obviously the integers are a subset of the rational numbers and the integers with respect to the operation in the larger group, namely addition, are of course a group. They're obviously closed under addition. Addition is associative. There's a neutral element or identity, namely zero, and every integer has an inverse with respect to addition, namely its negative number. So clearly, this is a group that lies inside of a bigger group. So we have the integers as a subgroup of the rational numbers. And in the same way, the rational numbers are a subgroup of the real numbers when my operation is addition. So those are infinite groups. Now an example with a finite group. We do not know too much finite groups um, yet. So we take the example that we started with, namely the dihedral group of an equilateral triangle. Remember, we showed in the exercises that this group is generated by the rotation by 120 degrees and the reflection about any of the three symmetry axes of this triangle. And this here means that all elements of this group can be written in this way, powers of R, the rotation composed with powers of S, where K runs from zero to two because R to the third power again is the identity and L is either zero or one because the reflection square is the identity. So now we consider the following subset, the cyclic group generated by R. Remember we introduced this concept in the last lesson at the end of the last lesson. So by definition, this set consists of all the powers of R where the exponent runs through all the integers. But here this is not as bad as it looks because we can start with r to the power of zero, which is defined to be the identity. Then of course we have r itself, r to the power of one. Then we have r squared, which in this group is the rotation by 240 degrees. And as soon as we arrive at r to the third power, we start again because r to the third power is the rotation by 360 degrees. So we are done. And also for negative numbers, what is r to the minus one? This is the inverse of r. 
but this is just rotating by 240 degrees. So again, nothing new if I take negative exponents. So this cyclic group consists only of three elements. Now clearly this is a subset of D3 and it is a group by itself. Remember in the last video we proved that as a corollary to I think proposition 2. I hope that's right. So all in all this here is a subgroup of D3. And of course similarly the group generated by any reflection is a subgroup. Here this contains only the identity and the reflection itself because s squared is the identity again. So these are two simple examples of subgroups of the dihedral group. Now to get a better image of all the subgroups one can draw the lattice of subgroups which looks as follows. First of all I've written down the, all the elements of D3, the six symmetries of an equilateral triangle in this notation here. So we have the identity R, R squared, S, R, S, which is another reflection and R squared, S, which is the third reflection. And it doesn't really matter which axis you choose for S because like that you get all the reflections. Then we have here the cyclic subgroup generated by R. And we have three subgroups generated by the three reflections only consisting of two elements. And that's it. There are no more possible subgroups. You can try for yourself. Simply write down any other subset and you will notice that this is not closed under multiplication. So it can't be a group. For example, here add the S, the one reflection. Then RS is not contained in this set here because it's another reflection. So those are all possibilities and now we draw this as follows. Here we start with the whole group. Down there is the trivial subgroup consisting only of the identity and then the more elements a subgroup has the higher we draw it here. So this subgroup has three elements so we draw it higher than those subgroups which consist only of two elements and now this here this line means subgroup obviously. So those are all subgroups of D3. Now if two lines intersect downwards this means intersection of those groups. So all the elements that lie in both groups this is always the identity. If you compare these what are the intersections of these sets here? you always end up with the identity because the identity is the only element that lies in um, two of these uh, groups if you take them together. So here again all the intersections end up at the identity. If you go upwards, so two lines meet upwards, this means here you have the group or subgroup generated by those twos, twos <laughs> by those two which is the smallest group that contains both of those groups. We're going to talk about that concept a bit later, but here it's pretty obvious. The smallest group that contains this set and this set must be D3 itself because there is no bigger subgroup than this here. So if I add something to it, I need to put in all the other elements and I end up with the whole group. There is no smaller subgroup that would contain these twos. So in this picture here there's a lot of information about the subgroups and how they interact with each other. But you can imagine the larger the group gets the more difficult those pictures will be. But for small groups they're a nice way of thinking about uh, the subgroups. All right now we are going to prove the so-called subgroup criterion. You take a non-empty subset. This is important because if it's the empty subset I can talk about whatever I wish. It's always true because it has no elements. So you need to be sure that you have a non-empty subset of a group. Then this is a subgroup if the following two conditions are fulfilled. I call them S1 and S2 for a subgroup. H must be closed under the group operation, meaning if you take two elements of H, then the product or the composition of both must always be in H again. 
and the same for taking the inverses, h must be closed under taking inverses. So if a is in h, a inverse also needs to be in h. Let's prove this. Before I forget it, there is also a condensed subgroup criterion which combines those two conditions. And there's an even easier a subgroup criterion for finite um, sets if H only contains finitely many elements. This is one of the exercises that I would highly recommend um, you do on your own. Because as always, if you simply watch the proof, then it's all pretty clear and you think, well, I could have thought of that, but could you really? So try it on your own. Also here, you might pause the video and try proving that on your own before we continue together. So we check all the criteria for a group because remember a subgroup is simply that a subset that by itself is a group. So first of all this must be an let's call it inner operation on this set so H must be closed under this operation but this is simply this condition here by S1 H is closed. Now associativity is easy because H lies in a larger group and we already know that in the larger group the operation is associative so of course it is associative for a subset. So associativity let's call it gets inherited from G because yeah as explained the operation is associative in the larger group. So then we need an identity which of course must be the identity from the whole group but how can we get the identity? It is not here. Now it's important that H is not the empty set so I can surely find an element in H otherwise it would be uh, the empty set. Then S2 guarantees that the inverse of A also lies in H and now the product of those two which of course is the identity, must be in H by subgroup condition S1 because H is closed under the group operation. Thus we see that the identity is indeed an element of H. If you're a complete beginner and directly saw this by yourself, congratulations, that's good. Because here I, I think this is not, not trivial, at least for a beginner. And finally, every element in H must have an inverse in H which is guaranteed by S2 so we are done. And again please try to prove the condensed subgroup criterion and the one for a finite subset on your own on problem set number four. Okay as an application of this criterion we take look at the following example we take an abelian group and define this set, the so-called torsion elements, as the set of all group elements such that g to the n is e for some natural number. And the natural number may depend on g, so it's not the same n for all g. That's why I write for some n, not for any fixed n. And we are going to prove that this is actually a subgroup of G called the torsion subgroup. So let's abbreviate this by H. Obviously H is not the empty set because E is an element of H because E to the first power equals E. So we have a non-empty set. And of course if this is a finite group then this is the whole group, automatically a group then, because every element needs to satisfy this, because there can't be infinitely many different powers of one element, otherwise the, the group could not be um, finite. So this is only really interesting for infinite groups, but that's not the point. We simply want to show that this is a subgroup, so let A, B, B elements of H. So this means by definition that there exist natural numbers M and N 
such that a to the nth power is the identity as well as b to the nth power and m and n need not be the same number. And we have to show that a b again satisfies this. So what do we do? We simply take the product of these two and raise a b to this power. Now because g is abelian, this is important, otherwise this is wrong. This power law that you know from high school holds a b to any power is a to this power times b to this power. Again, only because g is abelian. And now by a general power law that holds in all groups, we proved this proposition, I think it was proposition two, yes. We can write this as m a to the m to the nth power and b to the n to the nth power. So this is e to the n times e to the n, which of course is e, showing that the product again lies in this torsion subset. Okay, then again by proposition two, a inverse to the nth power can be written as a to the minus one times n, so a to the minus n, and this again by this power law is a to the n inverse. I can pull out the minus one. This is simply power law number two. So here we have E inverse, which is E. So indeed, the inverse also lies in H. And this proves that this set is actually a subgroup of G called the torsion subgroup. And remember, this is only true if, true if G is abelian. Okay, that's it for lesson five. As always, I encourage you to do um, the problem set number five and get acquainted with this stuff. All right, bye bye.